welcome to Explore, Explain. This is a long-form video and podcast series sharing conversations with data visualisation designers and developers from around the world. Each episode explores the detailed hidden thinking behind a single project or a series of related works to explain the what, the why and the how of the design process. There are some wonderful guests and some wonderful projects to learn about. So let's jump in to today's episode with your host, Andy Kirk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Explore Explain. In this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Craig Taylor to the show. Craig, it's wonderful to meet you, sir. Uh, thank you for joining me for this uh, eighth episode of this season two. To begin with, can you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do and where you work, please? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Um, this is great. So, yeah, my name's Craig Taylor. Um, my day-to-day -day job is a data visualization design manager for a company called Eto World. So I specialize in uh, 3D data animation, usually revolving around geodata. Um, outside of Eto, I produce a lot of side content for my uh, website, Mapzilla, which usually revolves around kind of abstract depictions of geodata. Fantastic. And it's one of these animated works that we're going to look at closely today yeah and it's uh what i've described as a, an enchanting series of <laughs> data-driven animations in a project titled transit in motion so for those uh especially the listeners who can't see this thing uh, can you just give a brief kind of synopsis of what this is about what we see kind of the the style of the work yeah so it's um well, I think the best way to think about it is that it's split into two parts, like sort of a phase one and a phase two. So part one was about delivering um, these kind of data-driven animations, which all revolve around how public transport um, is changing as of, um, in accordance with a lockdown um, due to coronavirus. So, you know, our schedules becoming less frequent, is the activity less Phase two kind of takes that data and manipulates it and makes it into something a little more abstract where we're not so much focusing on the inside but focusing on this pattern, this organic heartbeat or pulse um, of what this public transport is showing us over this period of time. And would it be fair to say that there's a distinction there between the first phase being the day job and then the yeah. second phase being kind of Craig Taylor, Mapzilla spin-off work. Is that a fair split? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. Uh, it's always difficult to sort of define that line between where kind of Ito stops and Mapzilla begins. But yeah, certainly the premise of the first one was kind of to deliver this project for some of our internal transit teams um, who might be interested in looking at what the data they work with day to day is showing them and, you know, the patterns. Um, and also for the kind of wider um, data audience on Twitter and what, what not, um, who might have an interest in this kind of new data that that we're mm. seeing um yeah phase two was very much a mapzilla thing so it used this kind of data but it was more a chance for me to get a little bit more creative with yeah. um manipulating this data and, and visualizing it in a way that i haven't done before with a tool set that i haven't done before so just sort of taking a step step back then um eto world is um there's, I mean, it's a, from the outside, it's a fascinating um, body of work that you get involved with. But can you just explain to listeners and viewers a bit more about the the role of the company, and you know, especially perhaps in, as you said, in the light of the the pandemic, why it's such an important data set to pursue these days? Yeah, I mean, um, so I work in the service team at Eto World, so I head up that team, and that team basically focuses on delivering clients. Um, we we focus on visualizing our clients' data in these kind of cinematic 3D visualizations, um, and that's only a very very small part of what the wider Eta World um, team do. So their main role is to kind of solve these transport challenges by delivering um, sort of real time data transit feeds, which have been improved, and and they do all sorts of stuff on that, and also providing platform for transit authorities and operators to look at their data and understand what's actually going on within their cities. Um, so, and that's a huge team, and there's you know massive teams of developers and city analysts and all that. And generally, you know, I I kind of on a day to day basis, I I'm I don't necessarily work with them all the time. I tend to work with our external clients, but this project kind of gave me a chance to speak to them a little bit more about what the, the data we have and how we can visualize it as well. Terrific. I mean, 
in this episode, I'm, I'm going to focus more on the phase two stuff, the, the real kind yep. of roll your sleeves up, get creative side of things. But obviously we <laughs> yeah. can't we can't look into the depths of that without framing it around the work that you did in the sort of phase one, which was, mm. I mean, even though it's still relatively creative compared to <laughs> many charts that we see out there, it, it's yep. by nature, it's a, a slightly more perhaps informative in, in its nature yeah. piece of work. Um, but again, just a sort of a, 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 a just sort of zooming out a bit more. I think that the the challenge of showing space and time is perhaps one of the hardest things to accomplish, um, and it's something that is a, a theme in a lot of your work, both obviously in the day job and in your sort of more sort of public endeavours. Mm. Is that something that you've just got a, a real kind of a real appetite for? It's just something that you really like going back to as a theme. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, well, being a geographer at heart, we're, we're kind of always interested in movement data, uh, the mobility of people and previous roles. We spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time looking at commuter flows and it was always this, um, I always felt it was kind of difficult to convey this idea of flow um, and movement from one place to another in mm. a static image. And and sort of when I joined Eto World, obviously I'm quite fortunate that we have these tools that allow us to analyze and, and, and kind of visualize um, really large data sets um, over, you know, huge periods of time um, in beautiful ways. And and that was really compelling to me. And and I thought, you know, I kind of felt like I was in a, um, a fortunate position to provide uh, sort of visualizations to people that might not necessarily have been able to see data visualized in that sense before, because I think you're quite right. It's, it's really, it's a tricky thing to do. And I think ne the tools that are out there aren't necessarily geared towards that kind of general audience of, mm. uh, well, okay, I have a transit model here. How am I going to see all these buses moving around mm. the city? It's not a sort of plug and go type thing. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, so I always felt like um, it was interesting for me and for other people to see data visualized like that. And there's usually a trade-off because you've got the X and Y committed to the location, yep. but then you've got this dimension of a measurement at that yep. location and then a temple dimension, which then almost kind of creates a fourth dimension of, of a story. So you're right it, in terms of the kind of standard tools or approaches we might use. For example, if you're going to go for a static piece, well, you're going to, you're going to have to editorially pick out one or two frames maybe mm. to show mm. before and after rather than the sequence or the, or the movement as you talked about before. Um, yep. And, you know, going back to the, the kind of core curiosity that this work was attempting to um, to provide some notion of an answer to at least, whether it's more on, down the line of the informative or more down the kind of more exhibitory, beautiful, seductive quality that you did for the phase two. This kind of curiosity about the lockdown, its effects, so uh, it's very much something that does have a captive audience right now. You know, we are, mm. we are living this, we are experiencing it, and... Yeah we're kind of intrigued about the, the, the impact on our normal lives. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a topic that does have a, a rich kind of audience appetite right now. Mm. And just thinking about the audiences for this, you know, does that, does that come into your mind in terms of thinking about the characteristics, their, their motivations, their capabilities, even to understand this stuff? Does that, how much of a role does that play? Or do you very much think about, really what works for perhaps you and your colleagues and sort of take them as a a potential indicative expert audience that the other people receiving this will eventually have to sort of fall in line with yeah it's i mean it completely changes um all of our well if we take the the sort of ito pieces that we, that mm. we sort of formally do for our for our um for our clients there's always a specific audience that we're tailoring to so we have to you know meet there has to be a narrative it has to be insightful it has to have their branding it has to have all these things um for them to understand it so so we work through through that quite iteratively with them with the sort of side project especially transit in motion i think the audience to begin with especially during the this this sort of phase one stuff was i just want to make this as clear and concise as possible mm. i don't want camera movement i just i want the main focus to be this animation of data and the pattern of that. And, you know, I want to use 
widgets or calendar, you know, the little calendar things I put in to sort of emphasize what's actually happening on the screen. So there's this kind of, so when you look at it, there's no, there's no sort of um, gray area as to what I'm trying to show. When I'm, when, when I sort of took that into phase two and I, I'm kind of being a bit more abstract, my audience is me, right? Yeah. So I'm not producing that. Well, I, I am producing that. No, I'm not producing. I'm producing that because I think, <laughs> <laughs> because I think this is going to look cool, right? So I think, okay, making hundreds of tendons between this data is kind of a really interesting and quirky thing to do. Let's see what that looks like. Am I worried about, um, you know, what a wider audience might think? Well, not really, because I just want to, this is purely for me, this is just mm. a bit of fun. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a small group of data artists that might go, oh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. What's that bus data? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's interesting. And, and I do think, uh, and it's been a theme in a few of these episodes this season, actually, that, yeah, sometimes when you are actively trying to inform somebody, you do want to be very careful about their needs and their capabilities. Yep. And you, you you have to either ask them, have a dialogue, or you have to really carefully imagine them. For works where there is a bit more of a, an exhibitory characteristic to it, you are designing for yourself and you are sort of taking yourself as a as a decent representative of the type of people who would also be interested in this stuff yeah. and then you put it out there you shine a light in the sky and see who comes comes looking at it um was this something that you did work primarily alone on or were there any collaborators that you you sort of worked with yeah so i mean um i spoke a lot of our internal transit teams about what their data is um and what sort of patterns that they that they might think um are interesting to show so there was a collaboration sense there i think in the general sense of you know who i work with at eto world um my sort of mentor hal bertram is the one guy that i sort of pass all my ideas through and he helps mm. me kind of hone the vision um he's a you know super talented developer as well so if there's a tool that i haven't got access to like he'll kind of build it for me so we work really well as a kind of team in terms of um that kind of stuff um mapzilla my side projects it's it's generally just me just tinkering around on my sort of computer um have recently started uh looking to collaborate a bit more with people and we did a cool little project with robin hawks on lightning data which was fun <laughs> um but yeah it's it, it's you know i'd love to work more with with people on this sort of stuff but sometimes it's difficult because I kind of think you know not a lot of people use the sort of tools that I use and it's it's sometimes it can be quite difficult to mm. to work together on a project which is you know looking at the lightning project me and Robin did it was it was a case of here's a data set let's have a look at how we approach it rather than work together on producing yeah. one output and I guess the subject matter itself although you will have a degree of expertise in the subject matter I guess there are you know, experts on transit matters that oh, yeah. you can consult with to say, right, you know, what's, is this a thing? Is this a phenomenon that's important? What's the, mm. what the nuances of this data? Um, because yeah, I mean, we, we could all, I'm sure, think that we are able of approaching a data set about bus journeys and just mm. dive into it, but there must be much far more oh, subject yeah. matter nuance about it. Yeah. And the, well, the transit models that we have are these huge kind of integrated models. It's not just one data table with stops and, you know, IDs and there's journey patterns, there's timing patterns, there's huge arrays of, okay, at this point, these are all the stops that it's stopped to. Then we need to find a way of expanding them arrays and joining this data. So we end up, you know, when we're just looking at sort of a scheduled bus journey around one city, you have these huge scenes of all these nodes just trying to get this time series data out of it. So which is why I kind of um, wanted to highlight this kind of data, the, the data analysis side and the data collection point is such a big part of any of these projects. It's not just a trivial thing and it's, mm. it is quite tricky to do sometimes, especially with transit data. Yeah. And and we'll come on to some of the nuances about the data in, in a, in a short while, but I just want to just sort of finish off the discussion about the sort of circumstances of the work. Obviously, yep. again, there's, there's two different phases here, but to what degree were you working to any timescales, whether that was imposed on you or did you impose any of your own deadlines to just get the thing finished? Yeah, I mean, there's there's always, I mean, I always impose deadlines on myself and, and that's sort of, it's a bit of a, a pain for me. I just like to finish projects. I like to have a date where I'm going to finish something, otherwise I'll just keep rolling on. But I, I think certainly with the 
the the sort of lockdown stuff i wanted to try and um get this data visualization out there as soon as possible really because it was so like this whole this event that was happening that affected everybody Mm. i just kind of wanted to respond to that quite quickly and say look look what's happening in rome Mm. like schedules are just completely dropping um so you know i started collecting data maybe at the beginning of march and and that whole process took you know over a month and then it kind of goes into the right okay i've got this data now how am i going to visualize it so i start i think i produced the first um, data visualization around mid-may and then every week after i'd post another city you know okay now we've looked at new york now we've looked at toronto or la um and then after that kind of phase one it was a you know must have been another two three weeks before i started being able to produce the the abstract stuff which was easier but it was it was pure design yeah that went into that rather than the data analytics and i guess you were already building on the the groundwork that you've done for the the phase one stuff which yeah at was, least gives yeah. a bit of acceleration there mm-hmm. um one of the starting points, I guess, in, in any project, uh, you know, when you've got these, you know, there's design elements and creative elements is we might have a vision for what this looks like. Um, we might have inspiration from elsewhere that we've seen methods. Now, I, I would imagine that the the phase one stuff that you worked on is, is, is perhaps characteristic of a lot of other work that you've done perhaps in the mm. past, which is this sort of, um, and you can correct me if I'm using the wrong terms, but some sort of 3D sort of prism map or a yep. um, isometric map. I'm not quite sure the, the technical terms. You can correct me on that. But um, for the the phase two two stuff, the 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 more creative stuff, you know what what sketches did you note down? What <laughs> bookmarks did you refer to? What books on your bookshelf do you sort of flick through and say, you know, I'd like yeah. to do something like that? I'm probably going to really disappoint you. Now, I'd love to have a <laughs> sketchbook with all these beautifully intricate drawings and these mood boards with all these different ideas on. But but actually, phase two didn't come about until I'd finished that phase one. I, I never thought to begin with, right, this data is going to show me that there's a really interesting heartbeat. There's this kind of pulse. Mm. So that means that I'm going to do this insight stuff, but then I'm going to get on to this kind of weird and wacky stuff. Um, it was never about that. It was as soon as I, you know, as soon as I started producing these things and I'd watched them on repeat, it was like, oh, there is a kind of playfulness to that mm. data. Um, and that kind of made me think, and I, it, you know, data art is always something that I've wanted to get involved with, but I've never really... I don't know. I I feel like a bit of an imposter when I even mention art in the same breath as my work. And and I kind of thought, uh, okay, well, let's just give it a go. Let's just go full tilt on taking this data and making it into this kind of weird stuff. And, And I didn't have a notion of what that was until I was sort of in the in Houdini in in the software and just playing around with what kind of tools I could do and what kind of methods that I can represent this data with. Right. And sort of you know okay, right, I have all these particles. What if I made these sort of like look like these big balloons that were just going up and down? And okay, that works, right, brilliant. Okay, bank that one. Okay, what's this tool here? Oh, it connects lots of points together and creates these tendons. Wow, brilliant. Okay, we'll bank that one. So it wasn't a case of I knew what I was doing going into it, Mm. um, but I kind of had this idea of, right, I want something that's really glossy, really, you know, high quality, um, has this playfulness to it. and you know and has all this color and glow and all that sort of stuff so i kind of knew that i wanted i kind of knew what the 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 the, the feel of what i wanted but i yes. didn't know what that was going to be yeah that's interesting i think there's something there about the that you're right saying it's the it's the kind of capability or the scope of the tools that can help mm. and shape that imagination journey yep but also that that almost tentativeness that you perhaps explained there about departing from the the constraints of work that has to be primarily informative to something where you've loosened the shackles and you are being self-expressionary and you are able to yeah. to, to break rules and to and to do things that's that is a, an uncomfortable departure i think for a lot of people um but i do i mean i, I don't i don't often meet people who have the scope to do that but those who i do I actually do recommend them to to practice and, and, and allow themselves to play and allow themselves mm. to break rules and, and to and to try things out. So I think it is is liberating and it yeah. can only improve the stuff that you do in the day job. It, it must. Yeah, up. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, 
Do you know what? I, I find it easier. To, I find I, I'm, I get really nervous before I post something that I think, okay, this is really insightful. This has ticked this box. You know, it's I've gone with these standard geographic conventions. You know, that all meets that. I find the abstract stuff way more liberating and way more, you know, I'm just going to post this and I'm not going to be mm. too bothered about opinion on it because this is just for me. This is just, I'm just creating something where I'm breaking rules. You know, there's, it, it doesn't matter. It's just creating art or creating data art, which focuses on pattern rather than detail. Yeah. And I think that can sometimes be a little bit more, um, you know, like it's less stringent. It's less, um, yeah. I don't feel like I need to tick as many boxes. With That's that. right. I, I do think there's. I do think there's a general. I think there's, there's a general mood in data viz right now. I think, where, you know, if you, I'm thinking back to sort of ten, fifteen years ago when we had this first collision course of the, the kind of purists, and then yeah. the emergence of data art and this yeah. kind of collision that happened. And I think since then there's been almost this, embracing of both sides more and more, especially over the last five to 10 years, where we do realize that not everything that we create, even if it's still representing data, has to, and I'm just picking out a quote that you put in your article, it doesn't have to be consumed with a logical conclusion. Yep. It can be felt, it can be something where it triggers an emotion, but also it, it leaves it open to a, in different interpretations as any artwork does, it's, mm. it's up to you. We're not gonna tell you what to think, you just feel what you feel. And I think that's yeah. quite, quite a nice um, departure for us to, to go down now, now and again, at least. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and I do think this, this idea of the kind of beating heartbeats, the kind of arteries, the kind of the anatomy of a city, I, th I think it does come out in the, in the style that we'll talk about shortly. Mm, it's quite um, organic. And just one last point, I think really from the point of view of the starting point, I mean, do you look at others in the field um, as source of, sources of inspiration for different techniques? Yeah. In, it might have had an impact on your, I don't know, the kind of colour color palettes that you picked or the different ways that you use the kind of camera angles. Are there people that you kind of look for for a bit of inspiration or influence? Yeah, I mean, there's, well, you know, I, I'm quite active on Twitter and I'm always taking um, inspiration from, you know, all sorts of people on there. And, and, you know, take for instance, this 30 days of maps thing that we're mm. seeing at the moment It's the standard of mapping and incredible. things being produced on a daily basis is just absolutely astonishing. And I think, you know, it's getting to the point now where especially 3d tools like blender and all them sort of things are becoming so much more accessible that people are producing content that is, is really different from other stuff that I've seen. And, and that is a, great source of inspiration and, and i love you know i love seeing all that I, I won't sort of name i've got so many people that I'd, mm. I'd want to sort of you know highlight but um i just you know twitter's a big source of inspiration but also i find media really inspiring as well and, and sort of film and tv and especially yeah. intros and like the you know the wireframe prometheus map in in prometheus and that's great and then mm. like the whole of i don't know if you've seen the expanse this sci-fi thing but the whole of that intro is like one big date of us and i'm pretty sure they have this sort of taxi new york city actual data right. in there it's just great and you know, watching that sort of stuff, and I love sci-fi anyway. So I take a lot of inspiration from that as well. And and yeah, I mean, half the time it is just like I said, playing around with concepts and and just coming up with with my own styles and my own ideas, and and seeing what the the sort of hardware and software can do as well. And and yeah, it's it's cool. Well, from um, kind of concept and creativity to to data, let's yep. <laughs> let's root this stuff in. Um... <laughs> In, the, in, in, in perhaps the more mundane perspective, at least. Yep. Um, and again, I know there's lots to the backstory of the data in this in this project, but can you just give yeah. a rough sort of timeline, so not, not timeline, sort of kind of storyline at least of where it came from, what you had to do with it? And I'm yeah. thinking just two, sort of two nuances. First of all, there's a, there's a point you make about the the slight kind of, uh, kind of curiosity about the difference between a bus in motion but then a bus with people in motion and, and that difference between it just because yeah, yeah. the city is actually moving. Is it actually people moving? Yeah. But also the selection of the cities that we see. Yeah. You know, what's the criteria for those? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
So the data itself is so Eto World um, receive all this data from various public APIs that all these bus services have. Um, once they have that data, that the, it goes through this Eto model where it's improved and maintained and all that sort of stuff. So and then that goes out to authorities. Um, my I got the data from the raw archive format. So when we take in our data, we some some of the cities we archive. Now, of all them, you know, hundreds of cities that we look at, a fraction of them have a GPS coordinate in them. So every two seconds when we receive these feed packets, in some cities we have the actual location of the bus. Which two means seconds, that, that's the granularity. Yeah, it's huge. Wow. Like it's it's um it's it's crazy the the volume of data i mean the volume of data that i had to collect i'll talk about that in a bit is just it's kind of staggering really um but being able to get that location um that gave me a sort of proxy for why well, i could do lots of stuff with it i can i can bin that data into certain areas of the city so i can find out how many buses how many unique buses were in a certain grid at a certain point um or over you know a period of time um some of the cities that we have don't necessarily have a GPS coordinate in them. They just have a, you know, uh, this bus is so many seconds between this stop and this stop. Mm -hmm. So that has to, we'd have to kind of interpolate at what point along this routed bus journey, this bus is, and that becomes a little bit more difficult. So, um, I mean, the cities that I looked at here, Rome, New York, Los Angeles, uh, Philadelphia and Toronto, you know, they're not as diverse as what I would like them to be, but that's purely because this started off as a kind of a bit of a side project and I didn't have that capacity to yeah. start meddling around with, you know, all these, you know, interpolating between bus stops and all this sort of stuff. So it was just, this is the easy data to get. I'll grab this and I'll just, I'll try this concept on that data to begin with. Um, I mean, there's something interesting there as well that, even though, you know, when we come to the representation methods, you know, you are you are applying sort of creative smoothing to help us see these patterns that you you almost wanted to preserve almost the integrity of the raw data so that that itself was robust. And then the the way that you kind of conveyed that had ways of breaking rules, but you wanted to kind of keep that purity of the data rather than yeah. having to, to to sort of make make up a, a sense of where a bus may be at any given point. That's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, you just sort of touched on there the volume. I mean, what what volume are we talking about in terms of <laughs> numeric values? Yeah. So, well, I was kind of naive to this process in that I I didn't necessarily know exactly how much data I'd need to produce these patterns. So I kind of went for the the max sort of data sets because it was easier to cut that mm. down rather than add to it obviously um so if we take new york for instance um so if we're sampling so the, the data comes into us as these kind of json feeds every two seconds so we've got what forty three thousand json files that need appending and they need something doing to them to put them into this kind of data table that we can then do something with um so that's huge that's like uh, i think new york had like maybe 14 million rows of data. Right. And so every two seconds, buses are getting. So there's a lot of duplication in there that we don't mm. need. Um, but then files were, you know, if you if you sort of save that as a CSV file with just the bare minimum location data ID, they were like two gig each. So right. um, that times six weeks times, what, six cities kind of becomes unmanageable. So there needed to be a way of simplifying that data whilst like you said preserving the integrity of it and i think that process was not sampling every two seconds right <laughs> you know we could sample every minute and you'd know that the kind of bus wouldn't it yeah. would still give you a, a fairly representative idea of that pattern of data um so by doing that and by binning the data into a grid over the city i was able to cut them you know, them 14.8 million rows down to, you know, about 10,000. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, there's something, yeah, even if you've got two-second granular level data, it doesn't mean to say that that necessarily needs to be used at that level because it may be that the the phenomena you're trying to surface is available from a 30-second aggregation or a, a minute aggregation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's overkill. I mean, if we were showing the actual bus journeys, so we were showing the motion trails of mm. them, 
then every two seconds would give you a really smooth, accurate mm. view. Because if you sample every minute, you might get, you know, corners of roads being cut off or whatever. So mm. if I if that was what my end goal was, then yeah, two seconds is great. But that wasn't my end goal. So yeah. Um, and a couple of points about that sort of data framing. So first of all, obviously different cities locked down at different stages and. You know, you talked about the sort of six weeks window. I mean, was there any point where you thought, I wish it was a different six weeks? Maybe just, you know, if we could nudge it that way or nudge yeah. it that way. Was there something about the patterns of the data that you felt was was sufficiently covered by this six week kind of almost before and after story? Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was tricky again because um, I went through loads of iterations of, well, will a week before lockdown give me a decent enough pattern? And then four weeks after. Um, and it kind of turned out that, well, I, I need a you know a representative enough sample before lockdown to get this idea of, okay, these are the general patterns. And then, you know, three weeks after to show how the schedules, if they did um, change, how they mm. would change. And what you'd find is that, I mean, three weeks isn't a long time anyway, but you know bear in mind we had this data acquisition process that was taking a while and this was a side project i had you know that bandwidth wasn't there to to do any more than three weeks either side and even three weeks after lockdown i was finding that you know when these um you know stay at home orders were issued in america it wouldn't just be the day after the the bus services would sort mm. of quieten down their their schedules. It would it would take a week or it take two weeks or or sometimes it wouldn't even it wouldn't even change. So there was there was definitely a sense of you know I'd like more data, but I just I just don't have that sort of yeah yeah. To do. And I think and going back to the point I made before about the distinction between a bus moving and people on the bus moving. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I imagine the point you're sort of drawing out there is that you know, the bus companies will probably be responsive as much to demand. So even if there's a lockdown issue, it doesn't mean that people are still needing to move around to get to hospitals or to get to, you know, different workplaces. But I guess at some point when there's just nobody on a bus, you think, well, let's just kill off that service. So how did you sort of go through that? Um, I don't know, managing, you know, what, what is the actual phenomena we are plotting? Is it people or is it the buses? Well, exactly. So Mm. it's, I think that there was a big caveat to this project in that the data, yeah, we are, we're showing the physical location of a bus and our proxy for um, value, our proxy for activity is if a bus existed on that spot at any point in time, what we what we don't have is ridership. We don't have sort of mm. occupancy levels of, we don't, we don't know who and you know, what demographic is on the buses to know that, okay, is, you know, are are more health workers on these buses now because they need to to you know uh, get to the hospital or, or you know, health practices. So it was, uh, you know, it, it, it well, like all these things, it was you just kind of have to infer what you can from the data whilst recognizing that there are limitations. And the limitation of this was that these buses could be empty. These mm. buses could have been empty before lockdown, and they could still. I mean, mm. they could be more. They could be busier now because more people are trying to get on, and there's less buses. So we can't really. I mean, that's just one of the limitations mm. of the data. And it'd be it'd be great if we did have that level of information as well. And the same with the the kind of you know the when I was recording the um, open sky data and, and the flight paths as well. Like there was, we didn't like a you know the they them could have been ghost planes just flying or they could have been a different type of plane just to keep their their routing so it's yeah. we, we just don't know really <laughs> yeah that's an interesting phenomenon of that the idea that planes have to keep going to preserve their routes uh, and yeah, otherwise they lose i mean it's uh, i mean it's cr- crazy that it still happens but nevertheless yeah absolutely <laughs> um so so what we're seeing in terms of the actual analysis that we see um the daily average count of unique buses yep. within each grid what's the kind of what what is the grid level yeah so that was um so the grid is based on the extent of the data and is i think it's about 150 meter wide grid which is granular enough to give you kind of patterns around urban areas but it is you know generic enough not to be too detailed Mm. right so it's you know so it's so there's a kind of trade-off there but yeah so the so i took the grid and then i had these all these locations and the idea was to match up where the location was. so bin all that data into a grid but when you bin that data into a grid you had you know, lots of duplicates of you know this i you know 
this bus ID appeared in that grid about four or five times because it was traveling through it. So there was a process of removing then duplicates and then counting how many unique journey, how many unique buses were in that point over the whole of the day. And that gave me this kind of 3D, um, you know, 3D pillar map mm. that showed how many, you know, where the activity was. And then we, we, you know, put that into a time series and we span that over um, six weeks and you can see the pattern um, of, you know, weekday and then you have this drop on the weekend and then, you know, in some cities you see a kind of dampening of that schedule um, as the lockdown date passes. One of the um, techniques that's not the preserve of any geographical display, but one of the techniques that's sometimes used to give a, a context of change is that you might perhaps leave a, a ghost effect of where a, a, a volume went to yeah to give some context to where it is now were you ever tempted to to do some sort of treatment like that i mean it would be incredibly yeah. difficult to pull off in a th third dimension but yeah no yeah i have and and not with this project but um it was one of the concepts i did for the uh the the, the flight stuff over europe actually was to have this kind of well it, it if you could imagine all the um all the pillars had like little hats on them right, <laughs> right. so you know, like an equalizer, like a um, pushes it up. Yeah, yeah, so it pushes it up and then it yeah. leaves it there. And then, but the problem was that you would. It was difficult to relate where that was in a three D sense with where this pillar was right. without having this kind of physical entity coming down. Um, and then you kind of. So there are ways of doing it, but it's uh, it's kind of tricky with three D sometimes in that the the simple things of a normal GIS um, or you know data visualization software of adding transparency when you do that in a 3D software with a dedicated renderer you bump your render time up like mm. you know crazy so it was kind of a trade off of oh, yeah, okay I don't really have time to, <laughs> to render a kind of ghost pillar but yeah you're right I mean it's that's one problem of the the visualization in phase one is that you don't have this kind of um relation to what that max value was other than this kind of little calendar that shows you the daily pattern yeah over the course of a um over a month so yeah it's tricky and of course i mean you know animation by its nature is you know it, it, our flaws as readers or viewers is that we can't remember very well what just happened mm. but if you are watching a relatively short animation that can be then you know repeated and spooled you can then sort of learn the rhythm and you can then sort of anticipate the shift. So I do think on that level, it, it, it's, it still works without having that, that feature of a, you know, residual where it was before. And I can, I can just imagine the, the difficulties of pulling that off and the kind of opacity and the overlaying of opacity on opacity. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was, the, you know, part of the, part of the reason for making these kind of, I think they were about 10 seconds, just quick little snips or quick little gifs was that, they're built to be watched over and over again until yeah. you get an idea of a pattern. It's not just a, you know, once you watch it once, then you know exactly what's happening. You know, watch it again and just see that pattern change mm. over time. Mm. Now, m moving on to the sort of uh, the design choices then. Um, yep. And again, you've, you've talked before about this sort of beating heart, this sort of rhythmic pulse that you, you, you mentioned in one of your uh, articles about it. Um, so you talked about the the tool and the capability of these different sort of particle visualizations and then the 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 tendons so the particles first what what are we actually seeing represented because we've got multiple sort of globules i think is, is my own technical term kind of growing out the ground you know what what's the actual representation that we see in each case yeah so um so there's a there's a really cool particle system in houdini um and octane as a renderer which i use without getting too technical can take advantage of these particles and, and spawn these kind of um, globules orbs or spheres on top of that data so if you can imagine um the each point is the center point of the grid mm -hmm. that was a pillar um the the sort of z value was the height at which or the value of that data or the total number of trips so that that orb at that height you know, that orb higher up meant that there was more activity there. But with 3D, obviously, you also have the opportunity to use another metric or another form of visualization. And so the size of the sphere was proportional to the value as well, as well as the color right. as well, because we use that as a metric. Um, so you have these big kind of spheres that are high up, which show in, you know, 
um, high values, which was which was fun. But the problem with that was that you have, <clears throat> and it's something that I kind of wanted to improve on, was you have these kind of big spheres that kind of overlay onto all the other spheres. There's this huge overlap. And one thing I wanted to look at, and I haven't had a chance to until quite recently, was this idea of a collision matrix. So as the sort of spheres rise and fall, they're all sort of bustling for position. And I thought that would be a really interesting, fun, fun way of um, visualizing it. But yeah, it's quite tricky. Absolutely. <laughs> And when you actually, I mean, I guess you will, you will, you'll learn about the shape of the data from the, the first phase, but was, was there anything problematic in this second phase with regards to, you know, extreme values, you know, really kind of big or really small that it just meant that you had to find a different treatment or a new well, camera angle, for example? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the pattern of data was very similar to the first one. So in terms of kind of them extreme values, they were kind of sifted out during the um, the sort of data prep phase. But there was um, there was one thing that became more apparent when I created more abstract visualizations was this idea of um, sort of interpolation or the playfulness of the data. So with the pillars, you'd have kind of these, these rising and falls. And, and it was always, as soon as it got to the top, it would, come back down again so they were linearly interpolated between but what when you kind of have these sort of spheres representing that there was a joltiness to it that felt like mm. it was kind of detracting from this kind of organic flow of data so um you can you can interpolate um via a cubic method instead so what you'd have is that you'd allow the system to overshoot that max value so you'd have these lovely curves instead okay. which was which I would never sort of um, put that uh, cubic interpolation on the actual inside data because in essence, you're falsifying mm. what that maximum value is. But because I was taking that out of context and I was just focused on this generic sort of flow of data, it felt like I could get away with that, um, you know, overshoot of, of data. So, you know, interpolating this in a cubic manner meant that it became more playful and it became more fun to watch. Mm more immersive really yeah absolutely and another phrase that you used in the description of the project is this idea of the sort of moving surface this mesh the yeah. kind of ocean that surges and you know there are loads of metaphors i think we can usually bring into this sort of thinking about the about the rhythm about the connectivity of it all about the you know the if you look at the surface of a, of a body of water the kind of the different ebbs and flows and the different wave yeah. patterns and you know, I'm thinking back to some of your other work, like the Coral Cities that you did. Um, you know, th there are useful sort of um, reference points for different subject matters that give you ideas. And I'm also thinking about the Orbs project, and I can't think or can't place where it reminds me, but it might be a music video, it might be a, a movie or something, or even an advert where you had a, a sea of balls and there's some sort of rhythm and they're all sort of bouncing up. And it, it does capture the idea of of rhythm and heartbeat. And one of the other characteristics of this project is, is the music that you overlay. Yeah. Yeah. The soundtrack. Um, and I, how did you pick that? Because it feels so cohesive. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. It was um, so. Sound is a huge kind of part of um, of the data visualization. It's something that I've never given enough emphasis on before. Yet usually we, you know, our client has a soundtrack that they want to put to it, or they have a kind of voiceover that, that we need to match to it. And um, but we we don't necessarily design with sound mm. first because all our designs are data driven. So we can't really <clears throat> we can't really dictate how that data pattern moves to a mute to a, a track we just have to hope that a track fits that which is really tricky to do because you end up having this you know this wonderful data visualization but you just can't find this track that kind of fits with the the beat of the data yeah. this project was a little bit different because you have that kind of seven beat data so you have the of the yeah. five days and then you have this kind of drop on the seventh day so it was more about finding a track that had this kind of this beat that kind of dropped on that seventh beat or that sixth, mm. seventh beat each time to kind of 
um, to put on it. And I, I was really lucky. So there's a there's a great website for sort of stock um, audio called Motion Array, and I'm, I'm a member of that. And I found this track on there um, that just fitted it. And it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a kind of okay that drops at this beat and that goes with where the the sort of data rises so that kind of works and and yeah it was a it was almost a bit of a eureka moment of when i added it and it kind of worked and i was like oh wow that, that just completely so was it did point. it fit kind of perfectly aligned or did you have to then go back to the video and change the pacing of that to then just just get it lined yeah there was the there track. was a few um there was a you know there was a few times where i had to tweak or like you know just extend a a, a um a uh, visualization a little bit because generally we uh, it's it's quite tricky uh when when i render it i ren- usually render at 60 frames a second over 10 seconds um which means that if i did want to drop down to a 30 frame a second animation i can extend that you know by double so yeah. i have i have a little bit of leeway each time to kind of extend or, or you know sort of trim a, a a sort of portion of that data visualization so yeah there was a sort of kind of a bit of trial and error with that but generally it kind of fit quite nicely so it worked but again it, it you know it's far from perfect and i think to get that you know i'd love to be able to design music and i'd, I'd love to be able to work with composers on some of these things but it's you know a side projects it's tricky to try and get well yeah i was thinking about that because i mean you know the last 12 18 months we've seen a few emerging sonification projects and I, I, it does feel to me that this is the sort of project that would absolutely lend itself as a data set um i can just imagine quite a few clients who just want to overlay the sound of a bus onto these sort of <laughs> projects but no this is something that needs a, a kind of unique track and they, this sort of segues to the second approach um the tendons and the reason why i mention that is because in this soundtrack there's a moment where I don't know if it's sort of distressed strings or some some melody, and it reminded me so much just listening to it of the the horrible moment in the film 127 Hours, where he slices his tendons to remove his hand trapped behind this rock, <laughs> and then the fact that the piece itself is tendons was just so perfectly aligned. But it's it's distressing on on a couple of levels there. But yeah, the, the, you talked about the tendon approach. Yeah. Now, is this representing the same thing as we see in the orbs, or is there a subtle difference in the kind of connectivity of this? Uh, yeah, it, uh, at its kind of broadest sense, it is showing the same data as the orbs. It's 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 the same point data set that I use there that's that's going into this data set. But what we have here is that for each point, um, I connect the say hundred closest. I, I connect tendons or you know origin destination things uh connections between the hundred closest um points so you have right. this kind of you have this kind of mesh that builds up so i oh god i'd love it if it was data driven i'd you know we, i do so much of origin destination matrix and i'm looking i'm constantly looking for a data set where i can apply this kind of tendon approach to that works with this kind of big data set and i've got some ideas about where that could go but with this it was just this kind of abstract depiction of mm. i'm just going to spawn loads and loads of connections between this data because my original idea was um to have a mesh that sort of like you said this like it had this kind of ocean wave to it because that's what it kind of looks like mm. um but i just couldn't in the time frame i had figure out how to interpolate this 3d mesh from this data so the closest thing i could think was to create these sort of yeah th- these tendons between the data which actually i think <laughs> looked far more interesting mm. in terms of its granularity because you have these these really beautiful patterns of where the data is connected which is completely random other than it's you know connecting the points yeah. with the data um but i thought that sort of that granularity of it and that detail was just so cool and that's why you know i do so many of these close-up shots within the visualization just to show you know this is how detailed this is this is this is really you know quite beautiful and when we get further into the sort of design discussion, we would normally talk about interactivity next. And this is obviously not an interactive piece. It's something that you've you've composed yourself. But I guess one of the interesting things there would be the choice of the camera angles and the choice of the elevation of those cameras and the the particular viewpoints that we see at any given point, which if you were interacting with it, you would move around it. But you've dictated that. What was your sort of thought process around the angles that we see and the the zoom in, even the bits of uh, the elements of focus and blur applied? What 
what's the yeah. sort of kind of creative decision making you've made there? Yeah, well, I mean, I wanted as many different angles as possible. So, and as many different types of sort of angles. So, I think the opening shot over New York is this kind of isometric view of the data that has this slow pan around. <clears throat> and then we go into these sort of top down views. And then, like you said, we have these real inset views. And what I wanted to do is it's quite tricky with, um, with sort of keyframing camera movement because you have this data that is fluctuating and moving quite fast. What you don't then want to do is have this camera that just kind of zooms all around the place mm. because it just creates too much. It's too much sensation for the viewer to be able to kind of um, take in and understand. So the thinking behind all the camera movements was I just want this kind of slow, gentle pan, um, which kind of moves across the city. And I just want the data to do the talking really, because that's, that's the thing that I want to see moving. But, having a static camera with 3d and not moving it sometimes it's quite difficult to see how that data looks in a different perspective so you kind yes. of have to have these these sort of pans that go around the data to show the different sort of dimensions of that data as well and and, and how it looks from different angles so it was you know the, the, it wasn't too strategic in terms of i'm going to pan from north to south over this city mm. and i want to focus in on this area here it was more i just want a general sort of you know pan from here to there or i want to swoop from here to there and and the the insets as well it wasn't a case of this is this is a specific data point that i want to show you that's mm. interesting which we usually do with with mm. you know we we use depth of field and focus in a lot of our visualizations to highlight narrative points or to to pull out um, patterns in data because it's a really nice way of creating an immersive way of visualizing that level that that sort of point of data and um, this was more about i just want to focus in on these really intricate connections and these interesting um sort of the, you know there's a point where i kind of pan over the bridge in um in one of the bridges in new york and it actually the way the connections are made looks like this kind of wireframe bridge it's just kind of i just found this this data this random data that was made from these kind of you know this bus value stuff was just really kind of beautiful in itself and that's the reasoning for just going focusing in on these kind of areas and i think that touches, touches on another point which is you know that there could have been temptation i guess from your point of view to to give some context to the the actual landscape in each case um you know and think about the, the phase one stuff you you do have these kind of uh, this kind of map layer to give a sense of the, you know, just even the outlines of cities and the coastal areas. Yeah. But as you said, the, the data is, is so, um, is so informative in some ways in terms of just its shape and its placement. You can bring out these artifacts of bridges and, and crossings and road yeah. networks that, that almost mean that you don't need to go that extra stage further to, you know, to put some detail of the, the actual landscape characteristics. So, but again, that's, that's a conscious choice to to not do that. Um, the the other question I have about the composition as well is the the whole whole video that you've put together comes in I think one minute thirty three. So, I mean, do you have a feel for whether this is too long, too short? Do you want to make it a ten minute extravaganza or a yeah. uh, you know what's the kind of decision you made about the sort of time frame and and also the allocation to each individual city within that? Yeah, it was. Uh, it wasn't a conscious effort of of sort of meeting a, a specific time frame. It was, it was just the result of you know putting in all these little segments. I mean, each one of these cities, I think I was just rendering out a ten second sort of animation of each one, and 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 with the different insets and stuff. So there right. was a. So I had an idea roughly how how long it was gonna last. Um, but generally, I mean, it was. I'd love it to last longer but i just kind of thought you know one minute 33 was one just one and a half minutes was good enough to kind of convey this idea of data and um, without you know getting too boring or, or being too repetitive um so yeah i mean it's i think the, the the one problem with with all this stuff is is and the one constraint really for me um as a side project is just render times with this mm. this thing and and you know it we're looking at kind of if you if you think a 10 second animation at 30 frames a second and each frame is you know we try and get that under two minutes it just these times just you know get get really kind of quite gnarly so i i'm kind of constrained with with how much spare time and how much capacity um my computer has i mean i didn't have to use the heating in my 
out for about a, <laughs> a month when I had the laptops <laughs> blaring, which is a bit of a so do this do this sort of project in winter rather than the uh, the middle of summer perhaps yeah <laughs> yeah I mean so. <laughs> I, I think it's something that's kind of under, under discussed or underappreciated perhaps about videos is the you know the, the deliberacy that you have to put into about the pacing the timing the duration mm. I mean I, I remember a few video animations from about ten years ago that were frankly boring because <laughs> either yeah. there was lots happening and it was chaos so there were no patterns to bring out or there was nothing happening. And it was just mundane. And I think it's a really difficult thing to, to get the right balance for. The, yeah, yeah. the, the other design factor, of course, is, is colouring. Mm. And we've got quite a few different kind of colour palettes that you've used from purple to blue to white, black, red, orange, yellow, white. I mean, again, what's the what was the rationale for those choices? And did you feel that you needed to give each city a, a slightly unique treatment to create that differentiation in the ultimate video? Yeah, I did. And so color, colors, you know, I love color, I love playing around color and the, the gradients in these visualizations are all kind of, you know, if we've got a dark base then they start dark. So you kind of get that smooth sort of interpolation between the ground plane and that sort of low lying data. And then it gets brighter at the top, which was generally the process that I use mm -hmm. for all the cities. The one kind of regret I suppose I had for this project is that it was it was this iterative pro process whereby the orbs um, were a little less developed in terms of the visual style than the tendons. So the tendons had these, I thought the tendons had these really lovely, this really lovely color gradient where it was black at the bottom. And then they had these kind of um, sort of colors that go to, to bright at the top and each city had its own sort of personality. Mm. And the the problem with the video at the moment is that the, the, the tendon, the 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 colours of the cities with the tendon stuff doesn't necessarily relate to the colours of the city with the um with the the orb so there's kind of like this I suppose a bit of a lack of synergy in the colour design going through it. and I think going back if I were to do it again it, it I'd have this sort of blanket approach it was more um as I was iterating through these designs it was more a case of okay you know now I want to try and black out all the orbs and have some random glowing ones mm. and see what happens there and it you know it was this kind of like you said like like I said this iterative process of okay that looked cool how can I improve on that and then cobble it all together at the end which is n not a great way of doing things but it was it was just about this kind of this collab this prod this hodgepodge bunch of <laughs> things that I had that I wanted to show and wanted to see if it worked as a concept before I kind of took things any further really yeah absolutely and. You know, I guess one of the other things that would always be tempting, and and this does again speak back to the first phase, is is labeling. You know, Philadelphia, yeah. Toronto, and you know, did, were you kind of keen to 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 not do that, to to kind of still leave it as, as these relatively abstract things? I mean, I think one of the joys that you get is almost the task of then identifying, almost like the quizzical nature yeah, of just, let me try and identify this from the shape of the data. Yeah, I think I, I think I did post saying can you guess the city from this I'll forget yeah <laughs> um yeah so i mean labeling again is is it can be quite tricky in 3d so we we use two styles generally if we're working in 3d i like to make the text immersive so i like to ha have this immersive experience so i like to put the 3d text within the scene so as you're panning around you can see this kind of mm. 3d text over here which makes you feel like you're sort of part of this um you know cohesive visualization um that necessarily that doesn't necessarily work all the time because especially in our day-to-day -day clients we day-to-day uh, -day client jobs we have this sort of iteration period and kind of after iteration two we say right that's a design freeze on render but we can start changing text and stuff and in that case we billboard on top of the visualization which you know can look great as a kind of dashboardy type you know informative piece but it takes away that immersion so there's a real sort of um, thing of, you know, do we risk having text in there and, and having to re-render the whole thing again and again and again when we want to change font or we want to change style? Or do we just have, you know, do we just bank this visualization as it is and then just, mm. you know, put um, text over the top of it? And I think I think with this project as well, especially the, the sort of title, um, which wasn't great and the sort of the way I presented it, it was this sort of, I suppose it was a bit of a product of side project fatigue and that I just wanted to finish this thing. I'll just, yeah, yeah. 
you know, I would just put this title block over it. But, you know, if I were to do it again, I'd definitely have this more immersive experience. And I'd probably actually, you know, think about having these kind of city labels in there because I think the abstract nature of it is so much sometimes that it is kind of difficult to make out, like, is this Toronto? Is that LA? Yeah. It's easy when there's a coast. Like, it's yes. easy when you can sort of see the coastal boundary. Or a big but river, like the River Thames. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But other than that, I mean, you're kind of uh, subject to the extent of the data, which might ne- not might not necessarily be a geographic boundary. It might just be, this is where the data stops. Mm. So it's kind of difficult to make out cities. So, I mean, you've touched on a few things there that you say, you know, you know, looking back, you'd, you'd give this different treatment or not, but... Um, let's just sort of close with some reflections. What, what's your favourite part? So what, in terms of the design aspect or the choices you made, what's the, the favourite little detail or the favorite, kind of favourite little quirk that emerges from any of the parts of the video? I think, um, I think the music definitely makes it for me. I think, I think being able to, to watch it and for that beat to, to sort of correlate with the, pace of the data and the, the playfulness of it is a real sort of win for me so i think that was definitely this went from being a cool little project to oh yeah this is great because mm. that music just works and and music as well is something that i've tried to work in more and more projects as well and even sound effects as well which is you know something that i've never really done before but completely changes the whole vibe or something so definitely the music um and how that kind of intertwined with the visualization was probably my favorite part yeah i mean i i'm I... I find myself increasingly interested in this notion of textures, yeah. not just in terms of, you know, the design choices and the way that you might use different patterns, different typefaces to create different textures. But as you said, this extra sensory perceptual, perceptual layer of audio and, you know, you know, even tactile. And I'm just, you know, I do, I do see the possibilities of this becoming almost a 3d, literal 3d sculpture um mm. which moves me on to my kind of one of my final questions which is you know this feels like it should be in a museum or in a gallery as a piece projected on the wall i mean yeah. is that the sort of looking forward maybe not just for this project but is, is that the sort of work that you'd love to sort of aim towards kind of creating something that would be li- literally exhibitory yeah absolutely i think there's you know it if my work could be put somewhere that might inspire someone in some way or another, that is just the most, you know, that's the best thing ever. Like I'd love that. And I think, you know, there's always a sense of I'm producing this stuff on, you know, my screen and it looks great at 4k and it looks beautiful. And then I have to share it to Twitter in this little box that kind of, (laughs) and I just want, you know, I just kind of want people to view it. Like, like I'd be viewing it Mm. or not, you know, I'm not, looking at my visualizations mm. on huge exhibit screens but um you know coral cities for instance going back to that we 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 got that into the la auto show on these huge huge screens and that was like seeing my work on a on a massive screen was just incredible and mm. it was it, it it worked so well and i think yeah definitely like i i think the project as it is needs needs work before it would ever be sort of considered for that but i think the concept of yeah of this data and the concept of, okay, I'm watching something on the screen that's incredibly beautiful and incredibly interesting, but it's completely based on this analysis of bus data. And that's the thing with, I think with data art and especially the stuff, the the sort of data art that I'm trying to get into is that whilst it looks abstract and whilst it looks, you know, cool and there's, there's lots of effects going on, it's all stemmed from real data and Mm. it has a meaning behind Mm. it. And that meaning, you know, like I said in my blog post is, it takes a bit to understand sometimes and it's not necessarily obvious at first. And I, you know, I encourage people to, to, to try and, you know, watch the video and, and kind of see what patterns. Yeah. And I think there's something about the, uh, whether it's an instruction or an invitation to the audience to, to relax, to yeah. chill out, you know, to, to not worry about <laughs> reading off the size of this value, but just to see yeah. it's big or see that it's going up or moving. And I think, yeah. again, I think that's part of the, perhaps the shitted landscape over the last five, 10 years is that maybe more and more people are willing to relax into these things and not mm. expect things of them that are not intended to be delivered mm. in terms of a very informative reading experience. But yeah, I think you're right about the, the idea of the, you know, the optimum platform for, for experiencing these things. And in the same way that, you know, certain movie directors say, you know, don't watch this on your phone. 
you know, watch this in a huge cinema. And yeah, I think it's yeah. similar, you know, when we see stuff on Twitter, we might make judgments about how it works on there, but that's not what you intended to be the canvas mm. that it that it speaks to. Um, mm. Just my, my last question then is, um, have you had a favorite bit of feedback, uh, a favorite comment, or has someone said something about it that just most resonated with you in terms of, yes, I'm glad you've said that because that's what I wanted you to to, to sort of feel from it? Um, I, I, you know, I can't think of a specific comment. I think generally, um, you know, when, when I posted these things on Twitter, I think the it's difficult sometimes to get feedback on the sort of abstract stuff. I think the, the, when I was posting the Rome visualization that showed the initial pattern, there was a lot of feedback on that. And it was quite interesting, quite relevant to a lot of people. Mm. Um, when I posted the, the sort of transit in motion stuff, I think, you know, it was, I was trying to think what, what if any comments were on there, but it was, you know, I think it was generally well received. Um, but it, again, it was, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't releasing it. I wasn't, producing it for people to mm. you know that my main my main focus of this was okay this is my first this is my first proper go at trying to create data art or trying to create this kind of immersive experience with sound and all this kind of stuff so i'm i'm gonna do this because i think it's cool like i'm enjoying yeah. it and, and i think that that to me was the sort of takeaway is that oh okay i love i love doing this i love data art i love yeah. creating these kind of weird visualizations so yeah, that's definitely spurred me on to kind of do more stuff in that in that realm. And I suppose my last question, therefore, is you know what's next? What's on your uh, wish list or to do list for similar kind of endeavors? Mm. Really? Yeah, I think um, I definitely want to look at this uh, this collision thing mm. with you know. I definitely don't think this project is done. I think there's there's, there's more iterations. There's there's a more sort of um, polished experience that could, that could be gleaned from it. Um, and I also had this kind of idea like with these connections of actually visualizing the, the routes rather than these random connections, but the routes these buses were taking and having them build up over time. And maybe there was something in this kind of 3D network map of of that with these tendons, but the tendons actually mean something a bit more. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to whatever it is, it is that you come up next to us. But yeah, I Thank mean, I, as I say, I love the piece. I love, I love your work in general. Cheers, and, um, you know, apart from the distressing moment of the tendon slicing that brings back those <laughs> memories, uh, you know, it's a, it's a terrific piice of, uh, yeah, data right. art. And, you know, let's let's label it what it is and, you know, let's appreciate it for what that then offers people. Brilliant. Fantastic, Craig. Uh, yeah, lovely cheers. to meet you, sir. Thank you very much for the insights you've shared. Cool. Thank you to all the listeners and viewers. We'll see you again on another episode of Explore Explain. To see more information about today's episode, including some links to key sites and resources mentioned, please visit my website at visualizingdata.com. Here you'll also be able to find details about my book, information about my public and private training courses, as well as over a decade of blog posts. If you've enjoyed this series, please consider liking, subscribing, and spreading the word. See you next time.